Now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. So have you ever been in a position before of having to receive or deliver challenging news? There have been a couple of times in my journey of ministry so far where I have had to call employees into my office and deliver challenging news. You need to be let go. Those have been difficult times. Have you ever been in a position where you've had to deliver or receive challenging news? Just yesterday and Friday, for that matter, I had to deliver challenging news to two persons who have been preparing for ministry that the Board of Ordained Ministry of the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference did not deem ready yet for that task. An important task, by the way, challenging for the person who has to receive that news, important because we want to be sure that excellence in pastoral leadership is being deployed to our churches. You get that, right? I, I was in the position the last two days of having to deliver that news to two different people. It's difficult to deliver challenging news. It's difficult to be on the receiving end of challenging news like that. Two weeks from yesterday, my brother and I planned to have a conversation with my mother. It will be the delivery of challenging news. We must have the car key conversation with my mom in two weeks. Her eyesight continues to deteriorate. In the last two weeks, she's hit the front of her garage and backed into the wall at the end of the driveway. It, it's time. Have you been in a position where you've received or had to deliver challenging news? Paul is on his way to the city of Corinth. Corinth was known in these days as one of the little Romes. It was so much like Rome itself that it was one of a few cities that was dubbed Little Rome. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that Corinth was one of the places where paganism in all of its flourishness was running rampant. There is a hill above Corinth somewhere in the 1,800 feet range. On the top of that hill at this time was a temple to Aphrodite. Now, you know who Aphrodite was. This is the test. Let's see how much you remember. Aphrodite was the goddess of? Love. Okay. Well, let's just push it a little further. Aphrodite was the goddess of? Sex. And there were all kinds of prostitutes, shrine prostitutes. Then the stories are told of the way that the shrine prostitutes would come from the temple down into the city at night and ply their trades in that place. There were temples to Isis, to Poseidon, to any number of the other Roman gods. There was a, an amphitheater in Corinth that was the home to the Ithmian Games, second only to the Olympics, historically, in athletic competition. There was an enormous 8,000-seat um, amphitheater there, concert hall there, where concerts were being delivered again and again and again. It was a little Rome. It, it was the, a center of paganism. Paul feels called to go into this place and deliver the message of the gospel. How would you like to be in his shoes? 
you're walking into this particular place, and your charge from God himself is to proclaim the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ in a place like that. Now, he'd been in places like that before. He'd been in Philippi. He'd been in Thessalonica. He'd been in, in Berea. Just most recently, he'd been in Athens and had to do the same thing. By the way, in all of those places, he had some struggle. In all of those places, the message was received by some, but he ended up exiting those places on not so good terms, i.e. in several places they wanted to kill him. It was that serious. He'd been in Macedonia with some of his friends, Timothy, Silas. They decided to stay in Macedonia. So here's Paul walking into Corinth, a little Rome, all by himself. He's alone. So he tells the Corinthians later, when he writes letter, a letter to them, I resolved to know among you nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, there's a couple of important things behind that phrase. One is, that's the core of the gospel, is it not? Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the core of it. When, when you strip away all the other stuff... Jesus Christ on the cross, paying the penalty for human sin, past, present, and yet to be, that's the core of the gospel, we believe. So it's not surprising that Paul would decide to go into a place like that and say, I resolve to know nothing among you, among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Makes sense. It also makes sense when you have some awareness of this, the mindset that Paul might have been in at that moment. I just talked a little bit about that. He'd been in Thessalonica. He'd been in Berea. He'd been in Athens. He'd been in Philippi. He'd been in Macedonia. And in all of those places, he met resistance. And in a couple of them, the resistance almost cost him his life. So he's walking into Corinth and saying, you know what? If anything good is going to happen in this place, it's going to be because God does it. Have you been in that place before? If anything good is going to happen in this particular spot, it's going to be because God steps in and does something extraordinary. So part of that phrase, I resolve to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified among you, part of that is a mindset of Paul himself. I don't know what else to do in Corinth but to proclaim Jesus Christ because the only way something good is going to happen in Corinth is if God does it himself. The other part of it, behind that is that Paul knows clearly that it, whatever happens in Corinth, because of it being Corinth, if it's going to last, it cannot be built on anything Paul. Are you tracking with me? It can't be built on anything Paul. Not his wisdom, not his... Uh, 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 clear thinking, not his cute little anecdotes. It can't be built on anything Paul. It's got to be built on the only thing that'll stand the test of time, and that is the power of Jesus Christ and him crucified alive in the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that is going to enable what he does in Corinth to last in that particular setting. And so he chooses to simply walk into Corinth and to say among this little Rome, let me tell you about my Jesus. Now, how many of you would say that what, from what you might know of Paul, Paul would be arguably the greatest Christian preacher ever to have walked the face of the earth, save Jesus himself? Paul was, Paul was the superstar. And for Paul to walk into a place like Corinth and say, let me tell you about my Jesus, kind of betrays the education level of this guy. It betrays the experience that he's had among God's people and among the church and starting churches. He walks into a little Rome and his, his strategy for the gospel, let me tell you about my Jesus. Hmm. But what happens there? If you follow the story... Paul's willingness to simply focus on Jesus Christ and him crucified births a church in that place that becomes, as time goes on, 
one of the big churches of, of that region. Are you, are you tracking with me? He, he doesn't go in and present church growth strategies. He doesn't go in and say, hey, I read this latest book from my bishop. <laughs> Let me tell you what it says, and let's try to build a church that way. It doesn't, he doesn't say that. He simply goes into Corinth and says, let me tell you about my Jesus. And he does so because he knows that's the only thing that's going to enable what he does to last. And he does so because, watch this, he himself is in a place where he is beaten down and tired and frustrated and discouraged. And the only way he knows anything good is going to happen is if he keeps his mind and his focus on Jesus Christ in that place. Now, why is that important to you and to me? Why is it important that you and I understand that that what Paul did in Corinth has some power for you and for me? Well, I can only speak for myself, and I'm hoping that maybe it's going to resonate with you. In my life, The only hope for anything lasting that has power and has the chance to change and has the chance to impact the world is if my life is centered and focused on Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the only place. I I realize that we've been together a decade now, and, and it might have taken you a little while to come to this conclusion, but the reality is... There is not a whole lot smart about this. If if we were to rely solely on what Jans knows about what it means to do the church, sisters and brothers, let me introduce you to First United Methodist Church Cross Street or St. John's next door. It isn't about what I know. It can't be about what I know. It's got to be about Jesus Christ and him crucified as the source of our hope and our power and our focus for ministry. And if it's about anything other than Jesus Christ, it will not last. It'll just be a flash in the pan. And let me suggest this to you as well. In my life and in your life, I know you and I come face to face with situations like Paul was, tired, discouraged, depressed, weak, walking in to what must have felt like to Paul the lion's den. Do you have places like that in your life where you look at those places and you think to yourself, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to manage that? How, how will it ever, how will I ever get through it? And sometimes you stand on the outside of those difficult, hard places in your life. You stand on the outside of it like you would on the outside of a city and you say to yourself, do I really want to go in there? And sometimes you have that choice. Sometimes you say, you know what, I'm going to avoid that part of my life because it's just going to be too hard. It's, it's, it's going to be too, too messy to try to let God into that place and clean it up or, or fix it in any way. And then you have sometimes circumstances behind you. As you stand on the outskirts of that city, you've got circumstances behind you. Nudge it. Are you with me? Sometimes you have choice to go in or not. Other times circumstances are, are, are nudging you in there whether you want to go or whether you don't want to go. So let me, let, let me give you an image that, that came from Henry Blackaby that, that I've read, a, 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 I don't know how many times, but it just spoke to me this, this week. I'm taking our staff right now through a, a study by Henry Blackaby called Experiencing God. Several of you in this room have done this study. Our staff is, is working through this right now. And we're uh, beginning week three in our journey. And I had forgotten in this particular study the story that Henry Blackaby tells about his only daughter, Carrie, and her battle with cancer. So let me read this, a bit of this to you. When our only daughter, Carrie, was 16, the doctors told us she had an advanced case of cancer. We had to take her through chemotherapy and radiation. We suffered along with Carrie as we watched her experience the severe sickness that accompanies the treatments. Some people face such an experience by blaming God and questioning why he doesn't love them anymore. 
Carrie's cancer treatments could have been a devastating experience for us. Did God still love us? Yes. Had his love changed? No. He still cared for us with an infinite love. When you face circumstances like this, you can ask God to explain what's happening. We did that. Have you? We asked him what we should do. I raised all of those questions, but I never said, Lord, I guess you don't love me anymore. And here's why. Long before this experience with Carrie, I made a determination. No matter what my circumstances, I would never look at my situation except against the backdrop of the cross. Now let that sink in. I would never look at my situation except against the backdrop of the cross. Why? Because the cross, the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection are God's final, total, and complete expression that he loves you. My, my. Now let that sink in for just a second, situation, sisters and brothers, because I think that adds another layer to this whole dimension of Paul walking into Corinth and saying, I resolve to know Jesus Christ and him crucified and nothing else. Why? Because when he looked at the cross, he knew that it didn't matter if he was walking into the lion's den. He served a risen Savior, and that Savior was not going to let him go and was going to give him all the power he needed to go where God was calling him to go. And can I proclaim that with all the energy I have? Can you tell I'm a little excited about this? Uh, Can I proclaim to you with all the energy I have that whatever you're standing on the outskirts of looking at and wondering, can I go in there? Do I want to go in there? Wherever you've got some people trying to push you into places, can I tell you and encourage you to look at that situation against the backdrop of the cross? Can I encourage you to let the cross be the sign, the ultimate sign that forever answers the question, does God love you? And that sign is an absolute always yes. God loves you. God loves you and me. And even though the storm clouds are dark, and even though the challenges are hard, and even though we don't want to go into places in our past maybe because it can get messy there, we can go to those places because the cross is the ultimate propagation. (laughs) Proclamation that God loves us with a love that will never fail. I'll let that sink in. I came across a story in a book by Maya Angelou. You remember that name, Maya Angelou, the author? Here's what she said. She wrote a book called Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now. And she tells a story about a lesson she learned years ago from her teacher, her, her speech teacher, Frederick Wilson. F- Wilkerson, sorry. Wilkerson asked Angelou to read a passage from a book. The book was called Lessons in Truth. Now watch this. The passage ended with the simple line, God loves me. Each time Maya read it through in just the manner she thought that Wilkerson wanted, but each time he insisted that she read it again. Finally, on the seventh read-through, Maya Angelou began to cry. She realized the truth of what she was reading. And then she would write, I knew that if God loved me, then I could do wonderful things. I could try great things. I could learn anything. I could achieve anything. Are are you getting the connection? When, When you see life against the backdrop of the cross, what that tells you is that the love and the power that took one life and paid the penalty for your sin and my sin and the sin of the world and then brought that guy back to life again three days later, the power and the love of that guy is on your side. My, my, my. Now, would that change your life? Would would, would that change the Corinths in your life? If you were able to see the challenges if you were able to see the joys, 
if you were able to see the uncertain top days ahead, if you could look at all of that in the backdrop, against the backdrop of the cross, a, cro- a, a backdrop that proclaims the love of God that will never fail, that would change your life, would it not? So here's what I want you to do this week. How many of you, by the way, actually did what I asked you to do last week and unplugged for 15 minutes a day this week? How many of you did that? Okay. All right. So, so that's probably about an eighth of you. We got some work to do. Okay. But, but let, let, me, let me give you something else to try this week. For the next seven days, the next seven days, here's what I want you to do. This is going to require a little bit of energy. First thing in the morning, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at yourself in the mirror. Seriously. I want you to stand in front of the mirror and I want you to look at yourself. And then I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine behind you a cross. I want you to start your day that. Start your day looking yourself in the mirror and imagining behind you a cross. That act will remind you to see everything that happens in the next 24 hours against the backdrop of the cross. The people that yell at you. Do people yell at you in your life, by the way? Okay, a few of you. The people that speak ill of you. The people that say things about what's going on in the world that just really irritate you. The way you look at the world itself, the anxiety, the fear, the uncertainty about the way you look at our country and the way you look at our world. Look at that against the backdrop of the cross. And let it remind you that there, there on that cross is the absolute proclamation that the love of God never will fail and never will will end and that that love will be with you always now let me challenge you to do something else don't look at somebody else in the mirror don't look at the you that you hope to be don't look at the you that you that others want you to be look at the you that you are right there that's why i want you to do it first thing in the morning that's you (laughs) <laughs> right? First thing in the morning, that's you. Okay? Look yourself in the mirror first thing in the morning and imagine the cross behind you for the next seven days and allow that starting image to guide you into the rest of the, rest of the day and watch what happens. Because I believe in a God who died on the cross for you and for me to pay the penalty for our sin and give us power for living in the now. And I believe that that God once and for all said to the world, I love you. And that included in that world is you and every one of us in this room. Hallelujah.